Father God, <clears throat> we come before you today in the name of the Messiah, Jesus. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the peace of the city. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, for Mount Zion, that hilltop just next to the Temple Mount. And Father, we know that in the course of history, that city, that place where you have chosen to bear your name and that city where you will make yourself known to the nations through Christ's ministry, his trial, his death, his resurrection, his ascension from the Mount of Olives right across the valley from the old city. God, when we think about that, we want to pray for the peace of that city. Uh, Father God, we pray today, God, that you'd give peace in this region that has been fought over for years. This city was destroyed in 70 A.D., by Tiberius. This city was destroyed again uh, in 135 AD. It was destroyed again in 633 AD and uh, as the uh, Dome of the Rock was built on the temple site. And uh, Father, we pray, God, that in the midst of this history of turmoil and history of difficulty, God, that you give peace today. God, I pray that you would work in um, situations that go beyond Israel. Lord, work in the the minds and the lives of world leaders, even those that reject you, those that have rejected your son Jesus, those that uh, arrogantly see themselves as the solutions to all problems. I pray, God, that even in those arrogant individuals who've rejected Jesus, God, work in their life so that there's peace. And God, I pray for people who are grieving, people who are wounded, people who are attacking, people who are being attacked. Uh, God, would you bring peace? Ultimately, God, I know that there will not be a, a complete peace until Jesus, the Prince of Peace, returns. But we pray today, God, that in our time, in our day, that there be peace. God, do your work, accomplish your will, and uh, we pray, God, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Can we pray one more thing? Father, in the midst of all this, <clears throat> in the midst of a, of a city that has a, a Muslim quarter, a Christian quarter, a Jewish quarter. Um, God, and all the different groups that are represented there, God, I pray that you would do a work so that the gospel will be proclaimed in all the world. God, you said that salvation would come out of Zion, and it has come out of Zion. That is the place where Jesus taught, was tried, died, crucified, buried, rose from the grave, and ascended to heaven. That, that good news, that gospel has come out of Zion. And we pray in Jesus' name, Father God, that you would allow the gospel to go forth to all the ends of the earth, that people would hear the name of Jesus, people would be saved, uh, people would find a relationship with God through the only Savior that you have given to humanity, Jesus Christ. In the midst of all this turmoil, God, I'm praying that the gospel work will be accomplished in this era in which you have made grace and the gospel available to all of mankind. And uh, we pray, God, that this last purpose will be accomplished even in the midst of turmoil. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Hey, today we're going to continue our sermon series titled On Purpose. And today I want to talk to you about the first of five purposes. I want you to rem be reminded today that you are created on purpose by God. You are not an accident. Amen? You are not an accident. You are created on purpose by God. And the number one reason why God created you is so that he could love you. God created you to love you. And not only did God create you to love you, but God created you to love him in return. So he loves you, and that's why he made you, and his desire is that you would respond by loving him in return. Up here at the front, there are keychains <clears throat> and these little tags that we encourage you to get each Sunday and add to your keychain with scripture memory verses that go along with each of the sermons that we've shared. We've already done sermon one, Don't Waste Your Life. And the scripture that goes with that last week was sermon number two, which was you matter to God or that you're made with a purpose. And the memory verse from last week, I want to remind you of it, is Ephesians chapter one, verse four. I'm going to read it just in case I didn't memorize it very well. Anybody with me? This one has a lot of words in it, and so it's a little bit tougher to memorize. Hopefully this little device will help you remember the scripture better. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault 
in his eyes. God made you to know Jesus. God made you to love you. God made you to love him in return. And I want to remind you today that all of God's purposes are seated in his love for you. Notice that God didn't make you to have you do any old thing with your life. God made you on purpose for a purpose. God didn't make you so that you do just whatever you want with your life. God made you so that you would do what he wants you to do with the life that he created and gave to you. Is everybody with me today? Does that make sense? If God made me and he made me on purpose, then I want to know what his purpose is and I want to accomplish that purpose. Ultimately, he made you to love you and he made you so that you would love him in return. And I want to tell you today that God is pleased and it brings great pleasure to God when we love him in return. When we love God, we are pleasing him. You are planned, you are made, you are created, you are formed for God's pleasure. God didn't make you for your pleasure, God made you for his pleasure. Can I say that one more time? God didn't make you for your pleasure, God made you for his, his pleasure. And what brings him the greatest pleasure is when you love him in return for his love to you. When we love God and we love him in return, we call that worship. Everybody say worship. worship. And the first purpose that I want to share with you today is that you are created to worship God. There are five purposes we're going to look at in the next five weeks. Today is the first week we're looking at these individual purposes. God created you to worship. God made you for fellowship. God made you for discipleship to become more like Jesus. God made you for ministry to serve others. And God made you for a mission to tell the world about Jesus. Five purposes for your life as you walk with God. We're going to be looking at all these five purposes in the next, next few weeks. And let me tell you something. When, if you want joy and purpose and meaning in your life, you need to understand these five purposes. You need to understand that God made you, God formed you, God created you, God planned you for these five purposes. It's really interesting to look at the sermon titles, and you're going to see some of these sermon titles on your memory verse cards. You're planned for God's pleasure. What brings God pleasure? Worship. You're formed for God's family. How can I be in God's family? Get connected to your local church. That's God's family. Is everybody with me? You're created to become like Christ. Well, what is it when I become more like Jesus? It's discipleship. It's following Jesus. Um, you, are, you are made for a mission. You are made to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and give people good news. And each of these sermon titles are going to highlight the fact that God has planned you and God has created you for these specific purposes. So if I'm supposed to love God, God made me to love me, and it brings God great pleasure when I love him in return, how am I supposed to love God? How do we love God? Let me read a scripture to you. It's in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. If you are in a small group that's following this sermon series, you're going to see a little video from me. It's about 10 minutes long talking to you about the content of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And at the end of the version outline that some of you are looking at right now, if you're following along with the, along with the version outline, are small group questions that go along with that video. Even if your small group is not following that particular line of study this week, can I encourage everybody that's listening to me today, go to the Livestream Church YouTube page and watch the 10-minute small group video that we've prepared for you. And then... Study Deuteronomy chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 4 through 9, and you can check out the small group questions that are in the outline today and will be up all week on version. I want you to have more material. I want you to have more stuff. I want you to be able to think about this throughout the week and grow because we've created more for you than just what you're getting on Sunday morning. Is everybody with me today? So don't miss out on that opportunity. Look at this passage of scripture it's Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. How should I love God? Well, the Bible tells us how to love God. Jesus gave us the greatest commandment, and it's this. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. That is, we're to love God three ways. Number one, I'm going to love God thoughtfully with all my mind. That means he's going to get my attention. Everybody say attention. Attention. Number two, I'm going to love God passionately. That is with all my heart and soul. That means I'm going to love God with all my affection. Everybody say affection. I'm going to love God practically. That is with all my strength. And so that means I'm going to love God with all my abilities. Everybody say abilities. I'm going to love my I'm going to love the Lord with all my attention, all my affection and all my abilities. With all my mind, all my heart and soul and all my strength. Is everybody with me today? I want to encourage you to study that scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 through 9 and there's some extra information that you can get from the small group video and I think it'll be a blessing to you. You know, there are a lot of ways that people worship. And if you watch documentaries on Netflix or on YouTube or wherever, you can watch various documentaries and see how various different people worship. There's like the Buddhist way that people worship, where they cross their legs and they get themselves in a certain pose, and and oftentimes they try to empty their mind of anything. There is a Muslim way to worship. You know, in a Muslim mosque, there aren't seats. Like you all are all sitting in a chair today. Um, In a Muslim mosque, it's just a a floor, and everybody sits on the floor. And uh, then at certain times in the the service, everybody gets on their knees, and they put their head down to their kneecaps, and and they bow in prayer rather than sitting in in chairs. There's a certain way that that Muslims worship. Um, Some of you grew up Catholic, and there's like a Catholic way to worship. So you walk into the auditorium, and you find your pew where you're going to sit sit in a particular row, and you genuflect, right? You guys remember that? If you grew up Catholic, um, when it's time for communion, um, you pull down the kneeling bench, thunk, and the whole room just goes boom, 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 as all the benches come down. Anybody been in a church service where that's the case? Yeah, come on. And, uh, and then, you know, you kneel before communion time. That's the tradition, the way that they worship. And then when a prayer is done being uh, said or pronounced, make the sign of the cross. Um, just different activities that people are engaged in in worship. Evangelicals, we have a certain way that we worship. You know, we like to clap our hands. I remember the first time I wa- went to a church service where people were clapping their hands. I was like, what is going on? They're clapping their hands in church because I grew up in a church where there was no hand clapping, like not allowed. Anybody grow up in a church with no hand clapping, right? No, 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 no. And uh, then I go to this church and they're singing happy music and songs about victory and joy and, and this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. Like this is, this is not the kind of, I was used to haunted Christian music. Um, and so we listened to all the Christian music played on a massive organ in a minor key. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, dum, dum. And uh, that was all of our music uh, when I was growing up. And, and uh, so I went to this different church, and you know, people are clapping their hands, and then they, they sing out loud, like everybody's singing with all their might, you know, not just the choir members who can sing bass, alto, and, and uh, tenor, like, and, and know the parts and like to read music in the hymnal, but like everybody was singing. I was like, man, what's going on? This, these guys are excited about singing songs to Jesus. That's different. And then people would lift their hands sometimes, and and we lift our hands in worship because the Bible says that uh, we ought to lift our hands in worship. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord, the psalmist said. Uh, that Paul said in the New Testament, I wish that people everywhere would lift up holy hands in prayer. And so there's this activity of lifting our hands and, 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 and putting forth some effort, lifting a hand of worship to God, lifting a hand of acknowledgement to God, lifting a hand sometimes in confession to God, uh, lifting a hand in surrender to God. There are all kinds of ways in which we lift our hands before the Lord. And so there's all these different ways to worship. But I want you to see something today. Worship is not the song that you sing, the way that you raise your hand, whether you kneel, do the sign of the cross, genuflect, put your head between your knees, or lay prostrate, prostrate flat on your face before the Lord. Those are all positions of worship. Those are all ways to worship. Those are all activities in worship. Singing is an activity in worship. Am I right? Sometimes even dancing is an activity of worship to the Lord. Amen? 
and let me just say, I didn't grow up in a church where people danced before the Lord either. If you can't clap your hands, you're certainly not moving your feet. <clears throat> but here's what I want you to see. Worship is way more, worship is way more than songs we sing. Worship is far more than gestures we make. Worship is far more than the position you take. Are you with me today? Worship is way more than that. So how do I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength? Look at what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 tells us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. I urge you. Listen, everybody. I'm urging you right now. <laughs> I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. Here's what I want you to notice from this verse. Worship is my response to God's love. Worship is my response to God's love. God made you to love you. His desire is that you respond and you love him in return. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So in view of God's mercy, what he has already done, I'm urging you to worship. I'm urging you to do this because of what God has already done. So it's a response to him. Worship starts with God loving you first. And you are responding to him. Everything always starts with God. Amen? Everything always starts to God. So worship is my response to God's love because of his great mercy and his kindness, his compassion to us. Secondly, worship is giving back to God. God gave me my life. God gave me this life that started way back in the day. And you guys are like, what day was it? It was November 8th in that other century. <laughs> it's been a while, you know what I'm saying? But I'm just saying, God gave me my life, and God gave you your life. Your life is a gift from God. And when I'm worshiping, I'm giving back to God. And what do I give? I give myself. I give this life that he gave me. You gave me this life, and I'm offering my life back to you. Offer yourselves is the thing that I'm urging you to do today. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Offer your whole self to God as a living sacrifice. Listen, worship is not the thing you do on Sunday morning. Some people are like, well, I'm going to worship. You are going to worship, but worship is not limited to the one hour and 15 to one hour and 30 minutes that we spend together here on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Worship is not limited to the number of songs we sing. Well, that's the worship part of the service, and then there's the preaching part of the service. Can I tell you something? When I'm preaching to you, it is me giving my whole self to God. It's worship to God. And when you're listening to the sermon and saying, God, I want to hear your spirit's voice today. I want to hear your encouragement. I want to hear your instruction today. It's you giving your whole self to God. This is worship. Uh, when you're out in the foyer and you're fellowshipping with other believers and you're showing kindness and love and, and respect to other believers and you're making a new friend at church, you're giving yourself to the fellowship. You're giving yourself to love people. You're giving yourself to follow through with the command to love one another that the Bible gives us. And when you give yourself in that work and you give yourself in that activity and it's done as unto the Lord, it's worship. Listen, worship isn't just what happens in here. Worship isn't what happens with instruments. Worship isn't limited to music. Worship isn't limited to a church experience. Worship isn't limited. To worship can be your whole life. Worship can be your whole life. Matt Redman wrote this song years ago, and I want to read the song to you today. I thought, about, I thought about playing the song and singing it, but I thought if I play it and sing it, you'll miss the point. Because worship 
is not limited to music. You don't have to be a good instrumentalist, a good musician, or a good singer to worship God. You can be, you can be mute and worship God. You can be paralyzed and worship God. You see what I'm saying, church? Listen, listen to the words of this song. It's called Heart of Worship. It's by Matt Redman. It's about 23, 24 years old, I think. Listen to the words of this song. And I'm going to read it to you so that you get the meat of what he's saying. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I will bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Listen, worship isn't about a song. I love that little line. A song in itself is not what you have required. It's more than singing. It's more than worship music. It's more than Christian radio. Worship is how we live, and it's giving our whole self to God. So now that we've said that our primary purpose is to love God in return, and that is worship, and worship brings him pleasure, you are planned to please God, and worship pleases him. Let's dive into how we can worship God with all of our attention, with all of our affection, and with all of our abilities. You guys ready to hang with me today? Here we go. Number one, worship God with all my attention. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Everybody say mind. mind. Everybody say attention. God made your mind to be busy. God made your mind to be fruitful. God made your mind to think about him, to give him attention, and to worship him. Isn't that good news? Some of you are like, well, I'm not the smartest person in the world. It doesn't matter how smart you are. God's concerned about your attention, not your IQ. God's, God's concerned about your attention, not your education. Now, does he want you to grow and develop? We'll talk about that in another week. But listen, you can give God your attention right now today. You can start giving God your attention right now today just as you are. And when you do, it brings him pleasure. And it is worship to give him your attention. You know, it takes energy to put focus and attention on God. We've got to put forth some energy to do this. Have you ever started a prayer and then completely lost your mind? Thank you, God, for this food. Blah, 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 blah. I hope the, I hope the macaroni is done, and I hope, Lord, uh, while that other guy's praying over there, that the marshmallow topping toasted just perfectly because I like it a whole lot better when the marshmallows are toasted yeah and I don't like I don't like too much raw meat in the middle um oh amen anybody ever had that happen at Thanksgiving like you know somebody's praying over the Thanksgiving meal and your mind just takes off and floats on to some other place I'm I'm guilty I'm guilty right you've been there sometimes when we're praying uh, we kind of lose energy and we don't stay focused on God. Sometimes we start to sing a song, and as we get into that song that we've sung for so many years, we just kind of lose our minds, and all the attention goes out the window. Amazing grace, I forgot to turn the oven on. <laughs> when we've been there, I've been here a long time, what time is it? You ever, you ever been like that? And th Somebody's singing a song, and your mind just kind of drifts off like that. It takes energy to stay focused, doesn't it? It takes a little bit of effort. I went to my wife, uh, wife's grandpa's funeral in Cincinnati, and uh, her grandpa was a devout Catholic guy, and the priest came in to the visitation in the evening at the funeral home, and he stood by the head of the casket, and he said a few nice words, and he said, now we're going to pray, and he began to pray the Hail Mary. Well, I just have this thing where I don't pray the Hail Mary 
because I don't pray to people. And Mary's a person. Mary's a wonderful, wonderful, godly believer. Praise God. Amen. We're going to get to spend heaven with Mary. And so uh, I love Mary. I love the character in the Bible. I love that she's in heaven. I love that someday I'm going to see her because I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. Um, but I don't pray to her. And so, you know, I wasn't going to pray that prayer. And so I'm just standing there watching everybody else pray. And uh, I just happened to look at the priest. And I was watching him pray, and uh, he had lost his mind while praying, just like I did at Thanksgiving meal. And uh, so he's up there just kind of going through the Hail Mary, na 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 now at the hour of our death, and so forth. And then he glanced over, and he locked eyes with me, and he realized that I was staring at him <laughs> while he had lost his mind in prayer. And he literally, he literally went like this. <laughs> he like... <laughs> He was so startled, like, oh, this guy's looking right at me. And suddenly he was just like shaken back into attention. You know what I'm saying? Man, it's, it, sometimes it's hard for us to keep our attention on the Lord. And it does, take, it does take some energy to keep our attention on the Lord. Amen? The Bible says that we are to worship the Lord with all of our thoughts and with all of our attention, even when it takes energy. God has given you all of his attention. Listen to what Psalm 139 says about the way God created you. The Bible says that you have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I'm resting and when I'm working. You notice everything I do everywhere. God is pays attention to you. And so I want to pay attention to God. God pays attention to me far more than I can pay attention to myself. God pays attention to you probably more than you pay attention to you, even if you're supremely selfish. God is awake all the time. God is on call all the time. Anytime you pray, he is ready to hear you. God's eyes are roaming throughout all the earth looking for someone that he can find who is faithful to him. God is paying attention to you. Let's pay attention to him. Just as he loved us, let's love him. And we love him with all of our attention, all of our minds. Do you think your kids love you because you bring home a paycheck? Or do you think your kids love you when you pay attention to them? Your kids love you when you pay attention to them. How many of you are really in love? If you're really in love with someone, you think about them a lot. If you're not thinking about them a lot, then you might not be in love with them. Or you might need to fix your love for them. Amen? You've got children. If you've got children... You probably think about your kids while you're commuting to work. You think about your kids while you're at work. You're supposed to be doing this, but you're thinking about your kids, right? Why? Because you love them. God desires for us to love him and worship him with our attention. So how do I focus on God? Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 7. The mind, everybody say mind. mind. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God or his law, nor can it do so. Listen to it in the message paraphrase. Focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more about themselves than God. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper worship. Then it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everybody say mind. I'm going to love the Lord with all my mind. That means I'm not going to conform to what the world says and the world wants. I'm not going to live like everybody else lives. I'm going to live like God wants me to live. And how can I live like God wants me to live? I've got to have my mind transformed. I've got to change my stinking thinking to God thinking. I've got to change the way I used to think to the way that God wants me to think. I give him all my thoughts. Listen to Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus said, when you pray, everybody say, I pray. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Listen, sometimes the only way to really get our attention on God is to shut ourselves in somewhere with God. 
Man, when I get up in the morning, I have my quiet time with the Lord. I don't like calling it quiet time all the time because I don't think it should be quiet all the time. I don't call it quiet time because a lot of times when I'm alone with the Lord, I'm praying in the spirit. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm praying out loud. I'm singing out loud a song of worship to the Lord. It's not particularly quiet. It's not me screaming at God. (laughs) Not me raising my voice at God. But I will say this. It's not just quiet. It's me talking to God. And it's me shutting myself in with God so that I can start my day by giving him all of my attention. In that part of my day that is just for him. Psalm 105 verse 4 says, worship him continually. Worship him continually. That means I can keep worshiping God even after my devotional time where I've shut myself in with the Lord. I can worship the Lord as I get ready in the morning. I can worship the Lord on my way to work. I made up my mind several months ago, there's a certain thing that I pray for every day when I drive to work. And my drive to work is my reminder to pray for that. There's a specific thing in my life that I pray for every day in the 10 minutes I have to drive to work. My commute's not very long. (laughs) But every day I get in the car, when I start the commute, I pray for one thing. Because that's my reminder that that's what I'm going to do with my commute. Sometimes it takes up my whole commute. All the way into town, I'm just praying about that one thing. So I challenge you, let's find ways to make God a part of our thought life throughout the week and throughout the day, not just a church, for one hour. Here's some quick steps to help you love the Lord with all your mind. Number one, stop being selfish. Let's all recognize this again. God made me for his pleasure, not my pleasure. God made me for his pleasure, not my pleasure. I gotta stop being selfish. Number two, stop being a pushover. I'm not, con- I'm not going to conform to the pattern of this world anymore. I'm not going to let the world shape me. I'm not going to let the world manipulate my life. No, 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 no. I'm going to let God transform my mind so that I am what he wants me to be, and I'm thinking about what he wants me to think about all day and every day. Come on, is everybody with me today? Don't be selfish. Number two, don't be a pushover. Number three, start spending specific time with God habitually. Mark out some time where you block out all else and you just spend time with God. No TV, no news, no radio, no podcast, no earbuds, just you and the Lord. Is everybody with me today? And then begin to think about God throughout your day. And if you need to, set reminders or set an alarm. Um, There was a time in my life where I wanted to think about God more often in the course of my day. And so I took my cell phone and I set several alarms throughout the day. And the alarm would go off here and here and here and here and here. And each time my alarm would go off, I would do the thing that I had planned so that I would think about God in that part of my day. And now, for some of you, you have to be kind of specific or very careful about when you have your alarm go off because of work or school or whatever, right? But hey, set some alarms, set some notifications. One of the things I set in my life was when I drive to work, when I make the commute from my house to here, this is what I pray about. So, Let's not be selfish, don't be a pushover, spend specific time with God, and think about God all day long. You can do that. And when you do that, you're letting your mind love God. And your mind can love God all the time, all day, throughout the day. So what's the benefit of all this attention to God? Listen to Isaiah 26, verse 3. It's one of my favorite verses of scripture. And it mentions the mind. He, Jehovah, almighty God, will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind, whose mind is stayed, is focused on Jehovah. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on God. You want perfect peace? You want God's peace? Put your mind on the Lord. Number one, worship the Lord with all your mind. That's all your attention. Number two, we're going to worship God by expressing our affection. Everybody say affection. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Now, I think that I could preach a sermon with four points, and I could preach to you about loving the Lord with all your heart, and I could preach about loving the Lord with all your soul. Your heart is kind of the center of who you are. It's your passions, it's your desire, it's your emotions, and your soul is the spiritual part of who you are. But we're going to put those together today because of the commas that are in Mark chapter 12, and I want to talk to you about loving God with all your affection today. Worship isn't just what I do with my mind. It's not just an intellectual endeavor. It's also an emotional endeavor. And it can lead to some really wonderful emotions. 
it can lead to some really wonderful emotions. Amen? How many of you had some wonderful experiences emotionally as you worship God? Amen. Absolutely. You ever had like a surprise gift given to you that was of great value? Um, this summer, like the Lord paid me back for, for the first time ever. This was so big. So my, my deep freeze went out and I had to emergency find somewhere to put all my meat. Anybody ever been there? And I'm like, what am I going to do? Deer season's coming up this fall. I want to go out and get some deer meat. I want to be able to store things in the deep freeze. Uh, meat season is going to come up this winter. All my family that live out on the farm, they're going to want to butcher hogs and cattle and things like that. And they're going to want to send me meat. i got to have somewhere to put that kind of stuff. Anybody been there? And so I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Father's Day rolls around. And I came home from church on Father's Day this summer, and both my boys were home from college. I walked into the kitchen, and there was this gigantic box wrapped in red paper. And I was like, what? What is this? And I, my, my son said, Dad, we got you something for Father's Day. Well, I ripped that thing open, and there was a deep freeze. Woo! That's the biggest gift I ever got for my kids in my life. Like, my kids went together. My kids went together, and they got me a deep freeze, and it was like this explosion of affection for them because they gave me affection. Do you see how the transaction happens? You know you've received a wonderful gift. Listen, God's given you a wonderful gift, and because of his great gift to us, we ought to have affection towards him. Years ago, I preached a sermon. I said, why is the crucifixion so gross? Why is there so much blood? Why is there going to be a crown of thorns? Why did Jesus have to be beat and just scourged and these scars all over his body? Why did his beard have to be ripped out? Why did he have to have nails driven in his feet and his hands? Why did he have to be beaten and bruised and struck with rods? And why did the crucifixion of Jesus have to be so grotesque, brutal, so that we would see his passion, so that we would see the intensity of his love for us, so that we see the depth of his sacrifice for us, that we'd be surprised and stunned at the gift that we've been given. That's why God, in his Love and his mercy made the death of Jesus so difficult. So what was God's gift to us? Number one, God's gift is his love to us. We loved him because he first loved us. 1 John 4. The second gift was his son, Jesus Christ. God said, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. And a body has been prepared. And it was the body of his son, Jesus Christ. It was the life of his son, Jesus Christ. God gave us his love. God gave us his son. Jesus gave us his death. He gave us his life. And he died on the cross in your place and my place. And the last thing, God gave us the resurrection so that Jesus takes his resurrection life and he shares it with you. When you're saved, listen to me, church. When you're saved and you choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus takes his resurrection life like he's alive today and he shares it with you so that you're alive Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says we were buried with him through baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can live a new life. New life. Resurrection life. It's a gift to you. Jesus gave himself completely and we give him ourselves completely in return. Here's what I want us to do right now. We're going to pause and we're going to celebrate communion. Because we've been given a great gift. I want you to stand to your feet. Musicians are going to come to the front. Ushers, I want you to get the communion elements. And I want you to begin to share them with everyone today. <clears throat> we practice open communion at Lifestream Church. If you're in the room, everybody stand to your feet and look at me. We're going to celebrate communion. And then I'm going to preach the last point. Remember, there's three points in this sermon. I've only given you two. The last one's short. Everybody say short. If you're in the room today and you want to choose Jesus, God has given you a perfect gift. And the perfect gift is his perfect son who was sent at just the right time for humanity to choose Jesus as Savior. He's the perfect gift for you. He's the perfect gift to you for you to have eternal life. Say, I'm here today and I want to choose Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. 
you haven't chosen Jesus before, but today, today, you're choosing to commit your life to him. Would you hold your hand up and look at me for a second? I want to pray with you before we celebrate communion. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm choosing Jesus today. I'm choosing Jesus today. He's good. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, bud. Awesome. I'm excited for you. This is good. Anybody else? I'm choosing Jesus today. I'm choosing Jesus today to be my Savior. I'm ready for a new life. God has new life for you. You can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. Everybody who lifted your hand with me, can I tell you something? In the last month, there are about 12 or 13 other people that have chosen Jesus with you here at Livestream Church. Isn't that exciting? And we're excited for you. We're excited for you today. Now, we're going to pray, and I want you to pray this out loud with me. Just pray. Everybody bow your heads. Close your eyes. Just you and God. I want you to pray this out loud. You don't have to scream it or yell it, just but say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me, for my sins, for my forgiveness. Heavenly Father, wash me clean, take my sins away, forgive me in Jesus' name. Jesus, Thank you for giving your life, and thank you for new life. I'm ready to live with you and for you. Help me learn to love you in return. Help me experience your goodness, your joy, and your peace. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Lord, we thank you. And we welcome you to the family of God. Five people that chose Jesus just now and said, I'm following Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? It's super good news. I'm going to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians as we celebrate communion together. And for some of you who just prayed that prayer with me, hey, Celebrate communion with me. We're going to remember what Jesus has done for us, what Jesus just did for you. Isn't that great? We're going to celebrate what Jesus just did for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, before his trial, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance. What we're going to do right now is remember what Jesus did for us. Psalm 103 says this, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Forget not all his benefits. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember what Jesus did for me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread. It reminds me that Jesus gave his life and his body on the cross. That body was beaten, bruised, nailed to that tree in my place. And he took all the punishment for my sin. God, I am thankful for your grace and your mercy to me. And Jesus, I am so thankful that you're willing to give your body. Jesus, I remember. I'm going to remember what you did for me. And I'm going to thank you. And I'm going to live for you. Father, thank you for this bread. Blessed is food to our bodies as we remember your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take the bread together. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's open the other side of the communion element. In the same manner, or in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This little cup of juice reminds us of the shed blood, the red blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your son Jesus was willing to lay down his life in our place, in my place, as he shed his blood on the cross. And we thank you for the forgiveness that we have through the shed blood of Jesus. There's no sacrifice that could atone for all my sin like the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a sacrifice once for all, and we're so grateful for the sacrifice 
that your son Jesus made when he shed his blood in our place. Bless this cup to our bodies as we remember what Jesus gave in our place. Amen. Let's take the cup together. We just talked, let me end real quick here, the last thought. We talked about loving God with all of our attention and our minds. We talked about loving God with all of our affection, our heart and soul. Can I tell you something? God wants us to love him with all of our abilities, and that's our strength. I love to think about the strengths of people at Livestream Church. Some of you are amazing at math, and it's just like magic to me that you can do math like bang, 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 because you're good at math. Some of you are like amazing early childhood teachers, and it's like magic that you can teach a child and be so patient with them and see them grow and to watch them develop and, and to have like classroom management with like 22 to 24 five-year-olds in a room. Like to me, that's amazing. I think about some people in our church that are like amazing medically. Some of you just like know how to diagnose stuff. And I've seen people at Livestream Church that are nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors. And I've been to the hospital while you're working on somebody and you know what's going on. And you know what to do next. And you know how to handle an emergency like I don't know how to handle. And it's really cool to me to see your strengths, see your abilities. There's some of you, like you can fix my car, and I can't. You can fix my air conditioning unit in my house, and I can't. Can somebody say amen. Like, it amazes me to see all the different strengths and abilities at Livestream Church. And let me tell you something. God wants you to worship him with all your strength and all your abilities. That means you can worship him at work. You can worship him as you work. When I was a teenager, my first, one of my first jobs, it was like a real job where I'm going to get a paycheck and a W-2. One of my first real jobs, I first, when I first got saved, the pastor hired me to be a janitor. I think he looked at me and said, boy, that poor kid, he needs a whole lot more Jesus time. I'll hire him. So he has to come to church more. And so I got hired to be the janitor. And a guy named Frank was in charge of me at church. And we had 425 chairs like the ones you're sitting at. And I had to clean those chairs every week. And I had to mop the entire floor and buff it every week. So I moved all the chairs. And then I buff and mop the floor. And then I put all the chairs back. And then I scrubbed the chairs with a brush. And Frank said to me, Paul, when you do this work, I don't want you to do it for the pastor. I don't want you to do it for the money. I don't want you to do it for the paycheck. I, don't want, I want you to think about Jesus the whole time that you're cleaning these chairs. I want you to work to the Lord. And he gave me this passage of scripture. It's in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 says this, whatever you do, everybody say whatever, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord, not for people. Can I tell you something? When you do your homework, do it as unto the Lord. When you go to work and, and, and you're fixing tires or something, do it as under the Lord. It was easy to do it as under the Lord when I was working at church, right? But can I tell you, my next job was working at Jim Lewis Tire and Wheel, and so I'd be balancing a wheel, I'd be mounting a tire on a wheel, I'd be putting the wheel on the car, I'd be helping somebody as they were changing some brakes and things like that, and I kept saying to myself, I'm putting this tire on the car, and I'm mounting it properly, I'm balancing it right, I'm making sure that I torque every lug nut just to the right pressure, just like the manual says, because I'm doing this as unto the Lord, not for Jim, who owns the tire shop, and not for Phil, the manager who hired me, and not for my paycheck, not for the customer even. I'm doing this for the Lord, and I want to do it right for Jesus' sake. It transformed the way that I did all my work. When I brush hogged a field, and I was on that John Deere 2040, and I was brush hogging a field, I brush hogged the field as unto the Lord. 
When I went to school and I was studying and I was having to study the scriptures and get my college degree, I studied as unto the Lord. I wanted to make good grades. It was a struggle for Paul Shepherdly, but I wanted to make good grades. Why? To honor the Lord, not for selfish reasons. I just kept teaching myself over and over and over. Everything I do, I want to do it as unto the Lord. And I want to challenge you to love the Lord with all your strengths and all your abilities all week long. Do everything as unto the Lord. Maybe there's something in your life and you're like, hmm. I really can't do that as unto the Lord, like lie, or cheat, or steal, or hate my neighbor, or fly off the handle at my coworker. I can't really do that as unto the Lord, so what do I do? If I can't do it as unto the Lord, it might be sin, and I just need to stop doing it, right? Because I want everything I do to be done as unto the Lord. And watch this, the more we worship him, the more we worship him, the holier our lives will be. You ever notice that? The more I worship him, the holier my life's going to be. Listen, when you face temptation, you have a chance to worship God. Even when you face temptation or struggle or difficulty, you have a chance to worship God. Instead of that, I'm choosing God. Instead of that sin, instead of that activity, instead of that word, instead of that thought, instead of um, that action, I'm not doing that. That is not worth anything. God is worth everything. I'm choosing him instead. Even when you face temptation, when you say no to temptation, you say yes to God, do you realize that's an act of worship? I'm choosing him because I love him. And he gets all my attention. And he gets all my affection. And he gets all my abilities. Is everybody with me today? We're going to sing this song one more time. And Bill's going to lead us. And as we do, I just want you to take a few minutes and pray. Just meditate on the Lord. Think about God. Think about your week. Think about the things that are coming. And think about all the ways that you can worship him this week. I want you to make room for God in every part of your life. Every part of your life is sacred to God. No part is secular. So let's give him everything. Amen. Come on, lift your hands. Let's give him everything today.